this is the fourth advanced pediatric endocrine symposium which we are organizing the first one in the form was actually started off in 2017 and since then many of the faculty all the guiders everybody is the same and we are continuing with the same theme for a quite a long time it's been really a pleasure in that regards now when we had actually we were always thinking that pediatric endocrinology is a rare group of disorders which are complicated, which are cumbersome in terms of workup and very expensive treatment. So people used to, in a way, shrug away from pediatric endocrinology, don't want to go into this field and everybody was very scared, so to speak, about that. Now, when we thought about this, what we realized is that there are three issues in any health problem, awareness, accessibility, and affordability. Now, everybody says these are not affordable, but we believe that awareness actually is the elephant in the house. And if we increase the awareness amongst the general public, amongst the physicians, we would be able to improvise the care. And this was the motto by which we established the pediatric endocrine uh, group. And then we started the growth society working in that direction. Now, if you look at the pediatric endocrinology burden in India and the specialists who are available, what we see is that we would probably have a handful, maybe 100 will be the overall, maybe an overestimation also at the moment, but now with more fellows, the numbers will increase. So this is still is a very, very uh, small number for the burden of population for type 1 diabetes, growth hormone, thyroid, all those things. And pediatricians are approximately in much bigger number. So we need to really have a bridge in which things can improvise and connect between the two so that we can have a continual good quality care in everywhere. So currently, pediatric endocrinology is focused and centered in few cities. Some cities like Bangalore will have maybe 20 people who are there. But then some whole states will not have people who are trained at all. So we need to have more wider exposure. And that's why it's very important on part of everybody. And it's responsibility of us pediatric endocrinologists. And ISPE has been working a lot in that to really spread the message of pediatric endocrinology. We have been doing a lot of programs right from 2011. And you can see many of the same people have been involved and they have always been our inspirational force there. We started with our first program in 2011. And then since then, there have been hundreds of programs which were run in terms of workshops, in terms of advanced courses, practical courses across the country, which we have been conducting. Now, this basically is the third advanced pediatric endocrinology symposium. And from there, what we realize that if we keep on doing workshops, how much time can we spend? Like it's not possible to do workshop everywhere. So we started off with social media in terms of YouTube platforms. And from there, a large number of people actually were able to access and you don't need to be there all the time. They can access that. Then we started an on-site fellowship program and we've got Chetan from the first batch, Neha from the second batch today, who are there. We until now had 11 fellows who are being under part of training. Then what we realized is that if you want to have a structured training, we need to have a web-based program. So we started with a MediClasses uh, platform, which provides a lot of information, started with books, and then to practically use that knowledge, mobile applications were developed. So we have got a lot of e-learning videos available on YouTube with huge number of views. This is something which is available covering entirety of pediatric endocrinology. We have got structured learning program under our learning.growsociety.in. We also offer a two-year hybrid program for fellowship and a one-year hybrid for diploma. We had got a lot of people who come to us every six months for a week. They learn the exam. So it's a very intense process. So we are going to have some of the announcements about the results of the fellowship program, the first one. We conduct a lot of online courses, pretty much three to four every month. So it's quite intense. We have got a number of publications which are there. And what we are going to launch today is the second edition of our Pediatric Endocrinology Protocols, which is a completely updated book about latest protocols for pediatricians, pediatric endocrinologists, endocrinologists, and we'll be releasing this today. One major advantage we wanted to take was with regards to our application, because that will provide much easy access to use, because what you learn, if you don't use it immediately, you will forget and the errors will come in. And these applications were developed and they are now become the most popular endocrinology application across the globe. And we have done a lot of publications regarding the growth interpreter, which allows practical interpretation of growth. We have got the obesity interpreter, which has been validated. We have got puberty interpreter, which allows interpretation of puberty for thyroid, for DSD, and all of them have been presented and they are in publication in different places in that regards. 
Now, what we have done now is a very interesting thing, which is actually a combination of all that we have done. This is a bone age assisted interpretation of growth. So all the pediatrician would have to do is to put some basic data. It includes information like birth weight, sitting height. So all the rough things that we anyway write down and we measure, we just write the Tanner staging, we match it. We have the bone age interpretation. And as soon as this is done, it is using all the algorithms which are available. And based upon this algorithm, we will have a lot of information, data points will be available. So you will have specific charts, bone age interpretation, a lot of parameters. And this will predict the likely diagnosis, most likely investigation. And we are validating this now. So this will be a very valuable tool for screening pediatric endocrine disorders. And hopefully, so this is how the result will look like. So you will have charts. And you will have table which has got a lot of interpretation and then we'll give you the final interpretation as to what is the likely diagnosis in that regards. We are coming up also with a personalized intelligent EMR, which is going to basically decide based upon specific conditions, give the inputs for every condition. And once you choose those conditions, you get the data, you will get a output which will guide in terms of evaluation assessment. So only those which are relevant will come up on that drop down menu. And based upon that, you will have a state of the art evidence based algorithm driven approach, which will come and analysis will come. This will provide information in the form of also a nutrition chart. So a seven day meal plan will be there. So we had got a, recently we had this on site course in which we had got large number of people who had come from across the country. And we had around 200 patients who were seen over the last three days. And we had a very intense discussion, which was there. So this advanced pediatric endocrine symposium, we're going to cover a lot of aspects of pediatric endocrinology. We're going to talk about impaired PTH effect in the form of hypoparathyroidism, pseudo hypoparathyroidism, increased PTH effect in the form of hyperparathyroidism, and finally about low bone mass. So we'll start off with impaired PTH effect. So when we say impaired PTH effect, we mean it could be a PTH deficiency or a PTH resistance. Now, PTH deficiency in the younger age group will largely be genetic. And one condition you should always be aware about will be Dijot syndrome, which will be associated with cardiac malformation. So early onset within a week, severe hypocalcemia, cardiac manifestations, think of Dijot syndrome as a possibility. Acquired and syndromic, of course, as we discussed, you can also have abnormalities in the hearing, severe short stature and renal failure. So whenever you have hypoparathyroidism, look for deafness. Look for renal anomalies. Older age group, it's usually autoimmune. And when I say autoimmune, it is APS1 unless proved otherwise. So if you have hypoparathyroidism, be very, very cautious about the other manifestations of APS1, including adrenal insufficiency. And if you have a child with APS1 who has developed hypercalcemia and whose calcium requirements come down, think of a possibility of a cortisol deficiency, which is evolving. Now, rarely you can have a defect in the sensing. And when you are sensing the effect, you will have body will think your calcium is too high. So you will have hypocalcemia with hypercalciuria. So calcium excretion becomes a very, very important tool. And finally, you can have resistance because of a PTH problem or largely because of pseudo hypoparathyroidism. You will have <coughs> hypocalcemia, hyperphosphatemia, a short child, plum child, brachymetacarpia, cataract calcification. So I'm just making an overview before we go ahead on the cases on that. So when should we suspect of an impaired PTH effect? If you have hypocalcemia with hyperphosphatemia, everybody whose calcium is low should have a low phosphorus because your PTH goes up. If your phosphorus is high, you're dealing with a form of a PTH problem. Other than that, you have to exclude renal failure, of course, as a possibility. Magnesium deficiency will also induce PTH deficiency and resistance. And finally, prolonged vitamin D deficiency will cause a PTH resistance like state. So hypocalcemia, hyperphosphatemia, normal creatinine, normal vitamin D, normal magnesium. That's your impaired PTH effect. It's a rare disorder needing lifelong treatment. So don't over-diagnose. If you have coarse skin, brittle hair, intracranial calcification, cataract, and bone mass, you can think about these conditions. So you have to be careful. Very importantly, if your calcium is low, PTH should be sky high. So a normal PTH with a low calcium is significant. So you expect that if your calcium is low, your PTH should be high. If your PTH is not high, 
you are basically dealing with hypoparathyroidism even if it is in the normal range that's an important message and of course the approach will be once you have done a phosphorus which is normal creatinine which is normal you will then go and look at the pth if the pth is low of course you are dealing with basically a hypoparathyroidism now whether you have a calcium sensing receptor effect you will decide based upon urinary calcium and if pth is high exclude vitamin d deficiency and then think about php as a possibility and these are the rarer causes to look at from that perspective management is basically you have to treat calcium and you have to give calcitriol this has been the conventional treatment for both hypo as well as pseudo hypo now there are role which may happen with regards to the role of pth some people have used pth to provide lesser risk of hypercalciuria which may happen in that regards hypoparathyroidism you may lose a lot of urinary calcium causing nephrocalcinosis so your targets are basically lower from that perspective while in pseudo hypoparathyroidism your targets are generally higher and this is something to remember because pseudo hypoparathyroidism does not cause nephrocalcinosis your calcium targets are higher in terms of php where you will keep it around 10 while for hypoparathyroidism your targets will be somewhere around 8.5 to 9 and calcium sensing receptor will be exquisitely sensitive to develop hypercalciuria so you will use much lower targets of calcium from that regard so within this background we'll now push the cases to our experts and get the opinion on that viva thank you sir uh, moving towards the first case we have this 4 year old girl who presented with tick knee and muscle spasms uh, her iron calcium was 3.1 which was low and a high phosphorus level of 8.4 and she had a high pth level of 130 pico mole per liter so is this uh, php sir dr vijay do you agree with this diagnosis uh, actually i need much more information just not only iron calcium and uh, phosphorus uh, so i uh, dr anrag sir has already told you that uh, how to approach so before just jumping on the diagnosis of php i would like to see that what was uh, how renal function is there so i think that's a very valid point so yeah. now what are the results sir vibha definitely sir her creatinine was high it was 2.4 mg per dl okay so um, this you can see that uh, this is uh, renal failures so with high phosphorus hypocalcemia so before jumping to the diagnosis of pseudo hypoparathyroidism it is always important to look for these renal parameters and you can see in this case that high creat so pseudo hypoparathyroidism should be second to renal uh, and always this is a rare disorder so don't yes. jump into condition exclude a creatinine magnesium and vitamin d this is what and also is. any hypoparathyroidism yes meaning not necessarily just pseudo hypoparathyroidism any hypoparathyroidism because one of the thing is uh, as endocrinologists after some time Only thinking of parathyroid, you are thinking of all these, uh, you know, endocrine diagnoses. But remember, in this constellation of high phosphorus, low uh, calcium, the first and the commonest is renal failure, unless proven otherwise. Yes, very important point. Thank Next you, case, Vibha. Uh, we have this three-month-old girl who was referred to us for seizures. Her iron calcium was low, and she had a phosphate level which was also low. and we when we did the pth level it came out to be low so dr chetan what do you think is it hypoparathyroidism or you, we should work up again as we know that deficiency of parathyroid hormone will lead to low calcium but as it is also causing phosphate urea if there is hypoparathyroidism phosphorus shouldn't be this much of low this low phosphorus suggestive of normal or increased parathyroid action rather than hypoparathyroidism and first and foremost if the phosphorus is low we should be looking towards vitamin d causes rather than uh, jumping into direct pth level so maybe i would like to go for first uh, vitamin d level definitely sir when we did the vitamin d level it was low so now jethan why do you think this pth was 3.4 and this is a very very common problem we see yes because pth is a labile hormone it should be done from the plasma 
and it should be stored or transferred frozen. So many of the labs are uh, outreach uh, and with the distance to the hospitals, they are not doing PTH. So faulty transport or maybe a delay in the uh, uh, processing of the sample might uh, be the reason for low PTH. So I think this is the big message that if your phosphorus is low, why is the phosphorus low with the PTH being low? It's not fitting into the picture. So you always have to look at the PTH as a thermolabile hormone and transport PTH in I. This is what we discuss as a pre-analytical problem in terms of your assay. And in this context, I must say for all budding physicians, pediatricians, pediatric endocrinologists, if something doesn't fit the clinical scenario, don't blame the patient, <laughs> blame the lab. In fact, very recently I was getting a spate of TSH 1.8, 1.9, FT4, 0.4, where the upper limit of normal, lower limit of normal of 0.9. So Apollo was creating in Kolkata, you know, hypothalamic hypothyroidism, and the parents were all, you know, bent out of shape. So whenever that happens, check from another lab, no matter how well respected your lab may be. Thank you so much, sir. Moving towards the next case, we have this seven-year-old girl who presented with Tikni. She had a low calcium level and a high phosphorus level. Her creatinine level was normal. And when we did the PTH, it came out to be within normal limit. So, Dr. Suganda, how should we approach this case? So, now this is again strange, Dr. Suganda. The PTH is normal and yet the phosphorus is high. What do you think is happening here? And we have excluded renal failure. So, uh, first we see that there is hypocalcemia and uh, phosphate levels are high. So, whenever we see uh, phosphorus levels, we should uh, think about creatinine. Then we see that the creatinine is normal here. So, the next step should be uh, an assessment of PTH, uh, PTH. But for that level of hypocalcemia, uh, this PTH, although it is within the normal range, is abnormally normal. Yes. Uh, so, basically, the PTH uh, should have gone up. And it is, uh, despite that level, uh, we suspect that this is this is this is low only, uh, yes. despite the fact that it it is in range. So PTH is low for this level of calcium. I think that's a very very important point. Often people say, what is the normal range of PTH? I would say there is no normal range. You look at what your calcium is. You correlate PTH with calcium. You correlate insulin with your glucose level. You correlate your ACTH with cortisol. So always do as Dr. Subroto was saying. It's, this is the post-analytical issue in which it's us who are making a mistake. So a normal PTH, as I said, with a low calcium is low. That's the end of the story. If your TSH is less than 20 and FT4 is low, think of central hypothyroidism. So it's a contextual assessment which becomes important, I think, in this case. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> we have this one-week boy and we got a reference from the NICU for his seizures. His NI level was, uh, NI calcium was 2.4 only and he had a high phosphate level. His creatinine level was within normal limit and his PTH was again low. So, Dr. Suprata, sir, how should we approach this case and how should we manage this case? So, have you noticed that uh, in that stem, how importantly creatinine is uh, is displayed. So the serum creatinine is normal. Now I'll put on my endocrine hat. So a PTH of two is low in the face of a calcium of ionized uh, calcium of two point four. So the normal is some four to five point six five. So essentially, this is hypoparathyroidism. Now, the next question as a clinician is. Are there any other features? Because, you know, in this age group, if you look at hypocalcemia with, hyper, with low PTH, billions of them will come out. And D. George's syndrome, Kearns syndrome, Kearns, Sear, you know, all kinds of things. So he had a cardiac abnormality, truncus. So basically, <clears throat> the catch-22 or the D. George syndrome, in which they have, you know, thymic abnormality, they may have a conotruncal defect associated with this, and they may have none of these. I'm following two D. Uh, mm -hmm. D. George's syndrome. <clears throat> Later on, develop hypothyroidism, and that is what it is. But yes, in this context, the important learning lesson is that 
that PTH is low, think of congenital causes of hypoparathyroidism and yet B. George's syndrome. Because this is a contiguous gene deletion. So you may have all or some, it's like Turner syndrome, which all genes are affected, you will have a manifestation. And one case which we saw had a severe immunodeficiency. Yes. So that has to be a very, very cautious scenario in that regard. So immune assessment becomes important. Um, we have our next case. We have this three-year-old boy who presented with seizures. He had a low calcium level and high phosphorus level again, and with a normal creatinine level. On the examination, what we found, he has a whitish de uh, deposition over the tongue and the gums. Which was never washed out with a lot of brushing and everything. And uh, he had a PDH level which was low. So, Dr. Vijay, what do you think about this case? Yes, um, thank you. So, again, um, so history taking an examination and correlation of all the things in one setting is really important. So, we can see here that this is a three year old boy presented with seizure. Of course, this was uh, due to uh, severe hypocalcemia. Along with that, what we can see that PTH is low, so hypoparathyroidism is akin. But there can be, so hypoparathyroidism is association with candidiasis, yes. So um, there is candidiasis. So um, this is APS type of, that is autoimmune polyglandular, polyglandular syndrome, where we are going to have uh, autoimmune polyendocrinopathy, candidiasis, and can be skin manifestation also. Yes. Ectodermal dysplasia <laughs> can be there. So this is... So in hypoparathyroidism, as Dr. Subroto and Dr. Vijay said, if it is congenital early onset, think of renal, cardiac, hearing, all those things. Acquired most, it has to be APS1 unless proved otherwise. So you may or may not have mucocutaneous manifestations. It may happen that later on, hypoparathyroidism is the first endocrine manifestation. So this you have to be wary about. So as discussed, the associations include adrenal, which happens a bit later. You can have liver involvement, urtic area, and this becomes difficult to identify. So now we can do the antibodies to interferon, which can give you a diagnosis. In this regard, NGS plus minus may have some confusion. So still, the antibodies to interferon is the diagnostic one. Yes, doctor. Uh, where are they doing these antibodies? We have gone a couple of them, especially with Quest. And what is the antibody called? Uh, and uh, interferon antibodies. Is it uh, only specific to? <coughs> it's specific for. Uh, or... uh, it, no, no. It's basically antibody for the interferon in the autoimmune. The problem here is the autoimmune regulator gene, hmm. in which you've got multiple antibodies formed, and the one which is found to be most specific is this one for the interferon. So it's not parathyroid specific. For parathyroid, there is a NAPTH antibody which is separate. Hmm. But for this case, it is the interferon for AIRE basically. So this is the best marker, the most highest diagnostic accuracy is with this antibody. So this will predict somebody with urticaria and fever, it may predict the disease. But if you have all these features, you may or may not do that. That's a different thing altogether. NGS, supposedly because of the gene pattern, it may not pick up in some cases. So that's why even genetics, this is preferred. <clears throat> On follow, what we have found that he developed abdominal pain along with polyuria. He had a high calcium level, so we need we have to taper the calcitrol dose, and finally we stopped. Then his calcium levels became normal. So, Doctor Vijay, what do you think? What has happened with this? Yes, boy? again. Uh, so we have to keep in mind that this is not a single disorder, and this is constellation of symptoms, and the things can be evolving over a period of time. So at this juncture, I would like to say, uh, see that whether there is any adrenal involvement or not. So that I would like to see the uh, cortisol level. And before that, actually, uh, we can see the electrolytes. What are the electrolytes level? And you can see, I can see here that sodium was a bit lower. And you can see cortisol level is low. So this is very important. So if you have somebody who has hypoparathyroidism and the calcium requirements come down, a first possibility thing can do cortisol. Anyway, annual cortisol is recommended anyway in these cases. Yeah. So we followed him after two years and he was on calcium of 30 milligram per kg and calcitriol with 30 nanogram per kg. He was maintaining a calcium level of 9.8. And when we did the urinary calcium crater ratio, it was 0.4 milligram per milligram. And the USD showed the nephrocalcinosis. So Dr. So, Vijay, what do you think do you we should think? do? we have to see the level of cortisol 
and uh, we have to reduce the uh, this uh, calcium. So I think that's a big message we should yeah. discuss that the target level of calcium in hypoparathyroidism is lower around 8 to 8.5 because they will leak this calcium because the PTH conservatory effect on the kidneys is not there. So even at a normal level, the calcium will go out. So in hypoparathyroidism, I want to maintain 8 to 8.5. I'm happy with that. And that's very important from that regard. And add thiazide, which will also help out in this case. So I think we were very clear that anybody who has got childhood onset hypoparathyroidism, think of autoimmune cause, look for mucocutaneous candidiasis, hypercalcemia is a point of adrenal insufficiency, and the calcium target is low. That is an important message. So in another case, we have this 10-year-old boy who presented with seizures. He had a low ionic calcium. On examination, we found he has cataract. He has subcutaneous calcification. And the MRI and the CT scan he brought, it showed intracranial calcifications. So Dr. Sudhakandha, what do you think what we are dealing with him? Uh, so on presentation, we have a boy who has a hypocalcemia. And all these pictures depict a sign like uh, uh, they have cataracts, calcinosis cutis, intracranial uh, calcifications, brachymetacarpia. So uh, all in all, this picture is suggestive of a, a pseudo hypopara uh, type 1A kind of a picture. And uh, uh, with the flowchart that has been discussed previously, we should always look at the uh, vitamin D and creatinine levels. If the creatinine is uh, normal, then we should do uh, PTH levels. And uh, so so he had a very high phosphorus, very, very, normal creatinine, very high PTA. So this is a garden variety PHP. You should not miss this. But there may be subtle cases. Now remember, PHP is usually a later presentation. In infants, you will see a lot of cases of hypocalcemia, high phosphorus and high PTA. That is not PHP. That is basically a vitamin D deficiency, which mass presents like this. But this is a classical presentation, milder disease, and they will present like that. Now, the other big question is what should be the calcium target, Dr. Suganda, in this case? So here, uh, we can target the calcium to be around uh, 8.5 to not a very uh, uh, so lower we, target. We can keep it at a higher, higher level. level. The reason is that your uh, urinary calcium absorption by PTH at that point is a bi-allelic representation. What I'm trying to say, it is not affected in PHP because it's a, essentially a sort of an imprinting defect. So they will not develop hypercalciuria. The main problem there will be skeletal resorption. So they will develop skeletal disease with no risk of hypercalciuria. So you want to maintain calcium at a higher level in this scenario. I think that's a message which we want to give in this scenario. So they will have skeletal effects. So hypocalcemia with high phosphorus, round faces, brachymetacarpia, keep higher calcium targets in that regards. So now we'll move towards the increased PTH effect. And when we say increased PTH effect, we have usually hyperparathyroidism, which can really be isolated, can also occur with men associations and sporadic. But usually when we say hyperparathyroidism in the pediatric age group, we have the neonatal presentation of the severe form of hyperparathyroidism, which is because of a calcium sensing receptor defect, which is homozygous. If you have inheritance from both parents, you will have very severe defect. If you have inheritance from one parent, you will have a milder defect. And we'll talk about a very interesting case also in this, which can present. You can have a sensing defect, which causes familial benign hypercalcemia in which body is sensing your calcium to be low. So blood calcium is high, urinary calcium is low. They will never develop nephrocalcinosis. It's a benign condition, no need for treatment. These are extremely rare, so it's mainly hyperparathyroidism. So in the neonate, if you have severe dehydration, polyuria, hypotonia, check calcium levels. So all sick neonates, calcium should all be checked. Childhood, they will present more with hypertension. Nephrocalcinosis will be a major presentation. You get a calcium and you will get metabolic bone disease. So again, you have hypercalcemia with hypophosphatemia. So high calcium, low phosphorus. This is how PTH problems will act. Very importantly, you have to exclude causes of secondary hyperparathyroidism, including renal failure, vitamin D, and very importantly, treated hypophosphatemic rickets can cause such sort of a confusion. It may even cause tertiary hyperparathyroidism. So you have to be considering that. So hypercalcemia, hypophosphatemia, normal creatinine, normal vitamin D is what you want to establish. Again, interpret if your calcium level is high, PTH should ideally be zero. 
that is very very important if your pth is high this is hyperparathyroidism if your pth is normal you can think of a calcium sensing receptor defect and if you look at in that perspective if you have a pth above 20 in the setting of hypercalcemia this is hyperparathyroidism look at urinary calcium if it's high this is primary hyper if it's less than that you give a vitamin d level if it's normal it's calcium sensing receptor defect in between you give a trial and that will give you a response so essentially you have to look at the pth and urinary calcium which will give you the diagnosis in that perspective in that regard then you can assess of course if you have a adenoma you go for a minimally invasive surgery men one go for subtotal resection but this is what you may see the neonatal form where you have to do a complete near total parathyroidectomy is what is recommended and uh, usually in children the lesions are more multifocal so single adenoma removal is not going to help out so from that perspective we'll start with the next case so we have this 12 day girl in the nisu and she was uh, we called a reference for this irritability she was very dehydrated and she had a very high calcium level of 18 mg per dl and a high pdh level of 300 picogram per ml so dr subroto how should be approach in this case how much was the phosphorus phosphorus is very low. low so basically uh, the most important can you get back to the first slide yeah it, okay. this is there okay the most important thing here is the clinical manifestation the child is severely dehydrated sick and is 12 days old with a high calcium so when i was talking about my presentation on calcium disorders and rickets and all that one question i said that pth is little later on here one very important history has to be taken is is this baby getting excessive vitamin d the commonest cause of hypercalcemia in a neonate is atrogenic so with the pth i would have liked to see what is the vitamin d so in any case i assume that the vitamin d was normal yeah and the pth was high so this is a problem so this is a condition in which there is severe severe high you know life threatening hypoparathyroidism so i mean we can go through that algorithm but this immediately what it does it basically and you see the urine calcium creatinine ratio 0.3 per mg per kg what is that normal low or high it is low huh? it it's is not uh, not high for the level of it calcium it is not high now what is being implied is this is a form of familial hypocalcuric hypercalcemia in which if you have the homozygous form and then you have very high levels of uh, pth being formed as well so that this is the area on rug which is a little iffy because there is a very clear cut entity of familial hypocalcuric hypercalcemia where in effect the calcium level rises because it is not being excreted regardless of what the pth levels are yes. but if you look at it from the entity of genetics the homozygous form is nspt yeah. i mean severe you know yeah. uh, hypoparathyroidism a uh, neonatal hypoparathyroidism yeah. and the milder form is fhh yeah. but the treatment is totally different because yes. in here uh, if you want to go to the next slide please yeah. the treatment is you know this is very important these babies you have to hydrate them i mean they keep coming it's an emergency so double normal saline you know uh, and then what else do you give we give we give diuresis we give matlab saline then we yes give. you give uh, steroids so that don't get uh, absorbed orally you give pemidronate and recently senacalcet so senacalcet i have used only in one patient and clearly it is effective there is no doubt about it in a certain dose and often times when patients cannot go for surgery because uh, they can be on senacalcet for years i mean for months but the treatment of choice 
is to remove the parathyroids and leave a small little sliver behind. So this is very important. The same dose effect happens with GCK. So if you have a, a single gene with GCK, you will have very mild diabetes and we are happy. But if you have both parents affected with GCK deficiency, the child will have severe neonatal diabetes. So it's basically the same dose effect here. And what is interesting is in this, if the father is... If he's inherited... we'll, come, we'll come to the case. Right. Next case is there. So neonatal presentation, there was a familial benign hyper. So check the calcium and phosphorus in the family. You will get the diagnosis also. And surgery is the mainstay. So we have this 20-day uh, old boy who presented with irritability. He had mild dehydration with a high, not very high level of calcium. That is only, that is 40. And the PDH level of 120 picogram per ml. So uh, as Sir has discussed, that is, this is looking like a hyperparathyroidism and the surgery was planned for it. So. But over the next two, three weeks, yes. once we give the conservative measures, he improved. So what is happening? He is having milder calcium than the last case. PTH is not that high. <laughs> so are we dealing with something else, Dr. Vijay, in this setting? Yes. Uh, uh, we have to see again the whole perspective that what are the various levels. Contrary to the previous case, what I can see here that calcium is a bit high. PTH is not so high as uh, that yes. was in three. And the urinary to calcium create ratio is less. So again, we can see that whether there is any family member who is going to be affected and that is the dose dependent manner uh, presentation can be there. So, so father uh, had a high calcium with, norm, with low urinary calcium, mother was normal. Okay, so as we are anticipating that probably this is not a case to be much worried. Of course, we have to have good monitoring and other things, uh, treatment, but definitely there should not be any surgery to be done. And this can be a transient phenomena which can go over a period so of time. So this is basically that the child has a sensing problem. But the mother actually, the, he will sense mother's normal calcium as low. And in that setting, he'll start producing more PTH and this will then cause this hyperparathyroidism. A bit like when we discuss about GCK deficiency, that if the mother has GCK deficiency, baby is normal, he'll become macrosomic. Here, the mother is normal, but the baby has a problem. So he senses the levels at low. So for some time, this hyperparathyroidism will be there, but postnatally, he will adapt. So very importantly, when you have a neonatal severe hyperparathyroidism, start with conservative measures, but always get the parental calcium phosphorus done very importantly. And maybe genetic testing also now it's available. So you can get a clue in that regard. It's a self-resolving condition, comes from the father, and then he'll become like a familial a benign hypercalcemia which doesn't require any treatment, basically. This is a very important part to look at. And in utero, actually, these develop that uh, hyperplasia of the parathyroid yes. gland mm. and it resolves with time. Just like IDM, sort of, infant or exactly. diabetic mother, sort of a thing. So we have this 80-year-old boy who presented with abdominal pain. He had a calcium level of 12.2 and the low phosphorus level and with a PTH level of 60 picogram per ml. So for this high PTH, surgery was planned for him. So Dr. Chetan, would you agree with this surgery or you, we should do another? Again, the calcium is not that much high, uh, which can cause much of the symptoms. But of course, with this calcium, PTH uh, should be low, which is not there. So definitely, this is a high PTH leading to hypercalcemia. But again, we have to rule out the same calcium sensing receptor defect versus hyperparathyroidism. So next part is uh, 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 whether we need to see the calcium excretion. So maybe a fractional excretion or a urinary calcium gradient ratio should be looked for. So this calcium excretion is low uh, as with the level of calcium, which is going against primary hyperparathyroidism. And uh, so this comes to a diagnosis of calcium sensing receptor defect, which does not require surgery in general. So no surgical uh, advice should be given. Maybe we can try Sinacalcet if calcium is causing uh, much of the symptoms. And giving surgery will not help because main problem is urinary retention of calcium, which will persist beyond surgery. And you will never have nephrocalcinosis because they are not losing calcium. Your main worry is that. So PTH is not very high. Bones are not going to be affected much. There is no urinary calcium. You will have no nephrocalcinosis. So why do treatment? No, but why is the PTH high? I mean, actually, PTH 60 is normal. So there is a calcium sensing receptor issue. So the calcium suppression of PTH doesn't happen. That's why you will have you will need higher calcium level to suppress this PTH. 
But 12.2 is quite too, quite high. You know? Yes, you can have. Sometimes the levels may go up, especially if they are given thyroid diuretics. The moment they, I have seen couple of adults, they get thyroid diuretic, the levels will shoot up. So you have to be very, very cautious in that scenario. When they become dehydrated, illness, you can have mildish hypercalcemia. So often they are picked up only on routine screen. It's like your yesterday's condition we discussed that everybody gets a fasting sugar. It's 110, 120. And then you think of GCK. Same here, routine evaluation, 11, 12, something like that. Sometimes you will get this picture. And especially in somebody is on thyroid, this will be really exacerbated. So that will be a message to look at. The PTH will rise. PTH uh, will be slightly high because it is not being sensed. The no, calcium no, is not no, being sensed. Calcium sensing part is okay. Yes. But the hypocalciuria. Yes. So hypocalciuria is causing high calcium. Plus your PTH is also high to a certain extent. It is high to a certain extent. It's not that high. So when that's why when you have a homozygous defect, the level goes very high. So there is a tendency for high PTH, but it is not very high as compared to a primary hyperpara. In that case, the PTH will be much, much higher. But there, in that uh, severe neonatal, yes. neonatal severe hyperparathyroidism, hmm. that PTH is exerting effect. Even here, it is playing some role, but it, the major role is the urine. It's a milder role here, but it's mainly the urine which is causing the problem. But those patients, they also develop uh, the dehydration and all. So that yes, so once your calcium levels be, go beyond a level, you will see what is happening here is that you are shifting your urinary calcium excretion to one side. But if your urine, if your calcium was, let's say, 12, you will not excrete anything. If it becomes 20, you will start excreting. Just like GCK deficiency, if your glucose becomes above a particular level, your insulin comes into the picture and the sugar becomes normal. So here, if you have so much hypercalcemia, you will have hypercalciuria. So it will it will basically break through that. Uh, yes. So you whatever how much it will conserve basically beyond that level, it will start working more. So milder, no calcification, urinary calcium is low, magnesium is high. This is another message in primary hyperparathyroidism. Magnesium is low. Here, magnesium is high. No role of surgery. I think we can try to finish off this in quickly. I think then we can go forward further. This is about the low bone mass. We had a wonderful discussion yesterday. Hemchen talked about the assessment. So I've excluded the assessment part from here. So low bone mass, most commonly you will see would be osteogenesis imperfecta. And second will be steroid induced osteoporosis. These are the two most important. And the third, of course, is immobilization. Where we are often neglecting that. And that's a very, very serious thing. I'll focus about these two primarily. So as discussed by the expert recommendation, or we have recommendation that if you are PMD is more than minus two, but you have spinal compression fractures, which means that Z score is not relevant here. You need to consider treatment. If it is less than minus two, only treat when you have a clinically significant fracture, which Hemchan described wonderfully yesterday. And less than minus 2.5 without fracture, if there is a risk factor, if somebody is on steroids, if somebody is on some drugs which can affect, and then you can consider treatment. So BMD Z score is guiding you, but it's not the main driving force to decide treatment. And less than minus three without fracture, again, you may consider. Now, treatment option, of course, is zolendronic acid, which is a bisphosphonate now easily available. It's the next generation. It has got a highly potent anti-resorptive agent. And you have to think of the dosing. Very importantly, the dosing varies, the frequency varies because the risk of hypocalcemia is there. So you have to be very cautious in that regard. Give as an infusion, you can give in 50 to 100 ml normal saline. Over 30 minutes, there would be fever and that will be there for a day or two. Pamidronate, we are not using much now because it required multiple infusions. Zolendronic is a much easier one. Denosumab is also available, which may help in certain cases, but not for younger children. Teriparatide has not approved for children. So I think this is something it which causes we... osteosarcoma in rats. No, but still that uh, holds true yes, for so, children as well. So that's why it has not yet been approved in children. And denosumab is still biggest problem is causes hypercalcemia rebound. Once you so stop. there is not much use still in children. Yes. And still the indication is postmenopausal osteoporosis. Yes. But one, uh, two things. One is zolendronate is an anti-osteoclastic thing. The osteoblastic, we are yet to find anything yet. And yes. when that comes, 
that, that will be something like sclerostin. A lot of work is going on in sclerostin uh, analogs. So this is the monoclonal antibodies which are going to increase the osteoblast activity. So this is the, as I always said, if you talk about options of filling a tank, you can either say, okay, I'll stop the leakage and let the tank fill or I'll keep on adding more. So when you want to increase bone mass, either you create no, more bone or you stop resorption. If you allow the pool not to empty, it will become dirty. So the quality of bone that is there because of anti-resorptive agents is not very good. That's why you've got avascular necrosis. That's why you've got fractures, abnormal things. But that's the option available. So bone formation will always be better. But unfortunately, PTH, as you said at the moment, definitely not indicated in children because of the risk. I am looking more in terms of sclerostin agonist. That will be something which will help out in terms of formation. So when to treat specifically for OI in infants, if you have a congenital fracture and deformity, two to four years with recurrent fractures and five to 18 years, there are specific recommendations of two or more fractures per year, which is there. And then you adjust the dose based upon BMD. You don't want to over treat because if you over treat, you will have like a a dynamic sort of a bone. Bone is not going to be very good. So less than minus two, your dose is 0.05. Between minus 2 to 0, it becomes lower half dose. And once you reach more than 0, then you make it even less. So basically, you have to slight those titration. These are newer recommendations which are coming up in that regards. So we have this four-week-old girl who uh, mother complains that she cries a lot while handling and she had a history of recurrent fractures. Her x-ray showed reduced bone density, as you can see on the x-ray film. But she had a no similar history in the family. So, Dr. Subrata, sir, what we are dealing with? Four-week-old girl. So, this is yes, a sir. baby. Yes. And uh, already recurrent fractures. So, basically, it's an OI. Now, in OI staging, one is the mildest and the commonest. Yes. Two is lethal. Three is progressive. Four is uh, without, you know, three is blue sclera, four is without sclera. And then, you know, in that form, seven, eight are lethal again. In between, take your pick. So this is... This it's is more like an antenatal fracture. Yes. So it will fit into OI3. And now there are twin, multiple OIs now because OI is actually a term of weak bones, basically. What is it? Your bones are imperfect. So now if you go by the list, they say 25 causes of OI. It's all genetic causes. So uh, this was turned out to be OI3. That's besides the point, basically. But I think the treatment options we already discussed that zolendronic acid is there. And those who are comfortable with bisphosphonate, pamidronate also are using that. There's Actually, no problem. I am a pamidronate, you know, <laughs> sort of fan. I won't say guru. Because today, even today, although a lot of centers and the gurus of osteoporosis uh, keep saying you can use it in young babies. What is your experience? You're comfortable giving in young babies. We have been fine with this. We use a lower dose as discussed and then it's okay. And you give it every six months. Yes. And the response is good. Response is pretty good. It's the only equal. biggest advantage is a one shot. Yes. It's the outpatient thing, hmm. and you don't need to admit them. So cost with them down. handling becomes difficult in private sector admitting the risk of fractures, like suppose putting IV. So it's a messy thing. So one shot is much we prefer. So you, but you have to put an IV for the yes, the single shot. There you have to keep them for three days, multiple handling, and all those things are there. Because I have, uh, you know, I mean. With the, the expense of 30 seconds, the biggest problem of dealing with OI is when they hold the baby like that. I may say, Himchan, in Chennai orthopedics, this baby was held so much that they developed crunchy, crunchy fractures. And since then, the mother, the Bengali, has come back and she wants conscious sedation because I told her if you knock out the kid, we can give. So that time the baby was only 18 months. Now he's six and a half years and they still want conscious sedation. So anyway, but that's the important yeah. thing. So now on follow-up, what happened uh, Vibha here? On follow-up, uh, we were giving zolendronic acid 0 0.025 milligram per kg and the fever was well maintained managed with the paracetamol but uh, the child developed seizures. So Dr. Vijay, why does it happen? So, um, so again, we have discussed, uh, Dr. Anwar has already discussed, that what is the property of the zolotronic acid? 
So again, there are some acute side effects and other things. Apart from that, we have to really take care of calcium because it is going to produce hypocalcemia. And I think that um, this is the case where we are dealing with. So seizure due to hypocalcemia, and you can see the low level of calcium. So it means that we have to de-escalate the so titration method of dietary therapy. Be, um, and always give calcium and vitamin D along with that. That is important to consider as well. Yeah. So now a follow up. So after uh, follow up of twelve years, the uh, there was a functional improvement and the fracture rate has also reduced. And she had a BMD score of minus one point six Z score. So sir, how should we proceed from here? So again, um, this is we have discussed that. After dealing with acute things that uh, hypocalcemia we have uh, done with uh, rocalcol and uh, calcium, again, that is do, uh, dose titration method of jolitamic acid is really important. And you can see there that um, bone density test too, how uh, to go about that. So, this dose dependent manner along with clinical manifestation, because this dose is just not dictated by BMD Z score, but the clinical scenario so OI, if you have antenatal fractures, you require multi-system treatment. Bisphosphonate is very important and titrate. Later age, you definitely need to titrate. You don't want to overdo also. The only because... problem with the BMD is below five years, you don't have a BMD. That's also the reality. <laughs> yes. So largely the titration will happen around that time. You don't expect the BMD to go up so much by that time usually. See, but this is an important thing. Sometimes... Uh... I mean, this is a very rare scenario. What you talked about, it is possible if you keep giving the same dose. I mean, on PAMI, I've never, over the last 15 years, never had a problem. But this is something which can happen and one should be aware. Yes. But here, BMD is our, did, uh, did you talk about it? BMD below five years. Yes. One paper from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, which was published in Ames, and they have given uh, the data of BMC and BMD for spine for uh, children at two years and three years and I think, and they say it is, uh, they have quoted a lot of papers comparing to Caucasian data and it's very similar and it is vitamin D independent and the sample size is very good. So I think uh, that is uh, a positive uh, thing which we can use for our population. So generally, I won't expect a higher BMD by around five years. So beyond the below before five years, so it should be done typically after that. I think we'll sum up with last two okay. cases. So we have our next case, uh, this 10-year-old boy who presented with bone pain. He had a fracture after the trivial fall. He also had spinal compression fracture and the BMD Z score of minus 2.2. So as he presented late, he was diagnosed as idiopathic juvenile osteoporosis. So Dr. Chetan, do you agree with this diagnosis? Honor. Honor. So, so this is osteoporosis no doubt because of the spinal compression fracture with BMD Z score of minus 2.2. But still, as discussed earlier, the most common cause of low bone mass and osteoporosis is OI and milder variety of OI can present at this age. So thorough examination is, is needed. Uh, whether it has got uh, the other features, particularly with the blue sclera, which is the milder variety. So we can examine for blue sclera in patients as well as in family. Many a times it happens that one of the parent or, or family members might have blue sclera with a history of one or uh, two fractures uh, in whole life as well. So uh, this looks like a blue sclera uh, to me. So this is a milder variety of uh, OI, osteogenesis imperfecta. Now, will you treat? Uh, there is one spinal uh, fracture, so so that's an important uh, indication as well. Plus, we have to see the whole history, and uh, this is the guideline. So, milder form we might not treat, but we should be keeping check on BMD as well because it has already got a spinal uh, fracture. So, idiopathic term is always which should be done after you excluded everything. Yes, but sir. With a, uh, with a wedge fracture, you have to treat. You have to you treat have to treat. because the child is in severe pain, hmm. and in fact. Uh, these require calcitonin, they require, you know, pimidronate and now zolindronate. Yeah. And if if they are, you know, pre-pubertal, you might even, around the 12, 13 age, because my first case like this, juvenile osteoporosis, 
was way back 13 years ago when I just first came. We had to throw everybody, everything at the patient. And most important thing is you have to give that to prevent further fractures of the spine. Now this child is 26 years old, mm. no further fractures. And I guess because she's in active ovulation and this and that, the estrogens are keeping her, uh, you know, yeah. osteoporosis under So I think uh, IGO is a diagnosis of exclusion, but you may consider, but if there are fractures, you should treat definitely even that. So moving towards the last case, we have this 15-year-old boy who was a diagnosed case of juvenile chronic arthritis. He was on long-term steroids and he had fragility fractures. Uh, when the DEXA was done, he had a BMDZ score of minus 4.4. He had a testicular volume of 2 ml and the bone age was delayed. It was 12 uh, years. So, so he has got all delayed puberty, short stature, everything is there. So Dr. Suganda, how would you approach this case? So, sir, so, uh, as we have learned yesterday, uh, that we should correct the BMD for the pubertal stage. Yes. So, I would like to know the corrected BMD. Yeah, yes. so even after that, the BMD was low and he had fractures also. So, I think that yes. was something yes. which we are... Because this child is on long-term steroids. Yes. yes. And uh, uh, along with history of fractures. Yes. So, these children need high-dose uh, calcium supplementation along with vitamin D. Uh, according to recent guidelines, 1,000 milligram uh, per per day should be given along with 600 IU per day of uh, vitamin D should be supplemented and uh, we can also treat with uh, bisphosphonates. I think the main message is preventive is calcium and vitamin D and as soon as you have fractures you monitor BMD very carefully in these cases and give them bisphosphonate if it's required. So in this case corrected Z score was minus 2.8 and in this case, of course, we give zolindronic acid. So again, you have to prevent that is most important here. But then give calcium and vitamin D, monitor BMD. And as soon as the BMD is falling, remember the first slide I said, if it's less than minus three and on glucocorticoid minus two to minus three with some fracture, then you start treating on that. And bisphosphonate is the key therapy. But there is no prophylactic role, right? No prophylactic. Not, so if your BMD is less than minus three, the recommendations are, that you, if you expect the steroids to continue, better to prevent. So there may be a prophylactic role in a minus 3 SD setting. It's like growth hormone, hmm. how severe you are, that sort of a...